person's name. What? Like off center. Me? Yeah. I'm just looking down. Oh, okay. Let's go back to Acts chapter 9 this evening as we are continuing to look at Paul's incredible conversion. If you've looked at any of my studies on Galatians, you'll find, I think, seven messages with the same title, Paul's Incredible Conversion, because his conversion is incredible in the sense that it is clearly a supernatural work of God. And having said that, every conversion is a supernatural work of God. So you can't have, as you hear people say, Paul had a Damascus Road experience, he had a, a Pauline conversion. That's nonsense. That's talk. All conversions are exactly the same. And any idea that Paul's conversion is any more or less or different than yours, with the exception of time and place, is colossally absurd. If anything, this should tell us that God could save anyone, since he saved the chief of sinners who was a murderer and a persecutor of the saints. And we were looking at Paul being knocked off his beast, and the voice from heaven says, um, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And verse 6 said, He was trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And so we concluded by saying Paul's conversion to Christianity was immediate and it was real. It was genuine. He didn't have to guess. People today, they make a lot of claims about, about being a Christian, but you really don't know. You can look at them, you can see you're not sure what they really believe, but uh, we're being fed a bunch of nonsense that we are to accept everyone's um, testimony or everyone's confession as proof of Christianity. That is nonsense. That's nowhere taught in Scripture. Paul's conversion to Christianity was immediate and real. His obedience was instantaneous. I've heard people claim to be Christians they, they haven't been obedient to God yet. And they've been professing to be believers for years. That is clearly not a model taught anywhere near the scripture. Salvation changes the life and living of an individual. Clearly that is true. And again, since God saved the chief of sinners, the vilest of men, he could save anybody who falls under the same saving faith as Paul did. Now, the salvation of Paul was, of course, one of the greatest miracles ever seen in the entire Bible. This man was so bent on the destruction of Christianity that he was consumed with this continual, unceasing passion. The Bible clearly says every breath he breathed, he spoke evil of the church, he breathed threatenings and slaughters against the church. He sent men and women to prison, tortured and killed others, all for being disciples of Christ. And his conversion was one of the greatest acts of transformation in the scriptures. And this is what salvation produces. A salvation produces a transformed life. If there's any indicator that is the indicator that salvation produces a completely new life. And when you look at the word transformation, that we've had already some time ago, uh, the word by definition means an entire change in form, appearance, nature, and disposition. It is what we call a metamorphosis. Some people describe a metamorphosis as a caterpillar into a butterfly from one creature to another. It is a complete transformation. You, never, you ever notice a butterfly never turns back into a caterpillar or, or a moth? Once they're transformed, 
That's what they are forever. If the chief of sinners was converted and his life was transformed in such a way that he was never, ever the same person again, how in the world could we say that genuine salvation does not produce any immediate and notable, notice carefully my next two words, supernatural change? How can we say that? It is utterly preposterous to think that salvation does not produce a notable supernatural change. That's why I think a lot of folks in their stubborn and stupid rejection of the obvious, they're going to wind up in a lake of fire. That's where they want to go because they believe they have a relationship with God that doesn't exist because they've never been changed. Now, what I'm about to tell you is so rooted in the Bible so grounded in the biblical record that it is forever irrefutable. I wouldn't even try doing it. And what is that? First of all, salvation produces a supernatural change. I, I don't understand how in the world that can be refuted at all. Salvation produces a supernatural change. That is the clear evidence in Scripture. Number two, salvation produces a radical change. Whatever you were, you're not anymore. You're, you're going in the opposite direction. And we'll see that with Paul. And the direction where he was going and the direction where he's going now, he never goes back. His heart and life has changed. He's transformed. He's a new person. He's going back. That's why he said if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old has passed away. Old things means everything. Everything that's old is gone. Old things become new. He wrote it, and he lived it, and he's right. Most of what is called salvation experiences today has no root in New Testament theology. None. Zero. I've said time and time again, I wouldn't waste a moment of my time in life dealing with this stuff except to say that the consequences of believing a lie are damnation. It's eternal damnation. Do you want that? Because that's where you're heading. Your pride isn't going to keep you from judgment. Last, to simply mouth out certain words and pray certain prayers is absolutely no indication whatsoever that a person has been redeemed. None. Zero. None at all. It's not in saying words. You don't, so far we haven't seen anything being said. There was no repeat after me. There was no say this, believe, really believe. The only thing that Philip did was answer the eunuch's question. What, what hindered me to be baptized? I'm ready. He's ready. And he told him, he didn't say repeat after me this. He said, no, if you truly believe. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's an affirmation of faith, not acknowledging the facts about Christ, but acknowledging that he is your Lord. This man was ready. Salvation is a supernatural work of God. Now, just imagine, if you will, if Paul was saved, I want you to hear me carefully, because the absurdity is so obvious, and yet it's, it should be more obvious to all of us of the absurdity of what many are saying today is a salvation experience. Just imagine, if you will, if Paul was saved by the by some of the so-called methods of evangelism today. Now the preacher would say, Brother Paul, you need to believe in Jesus and repeat this prayer with me, and you will be saved. Paul would say, but I still feel the need to kill a few Christians every now and then. Then the preacher would say, well, Paul, we, we all feel weak. We all have a besetting sin. Yours just happens to be that you need to kill a few Christians every now and then. God understands your heart. And he will forgive you. Just look at the progress that you've made so far. Praise God you're not killing as many saints as you used to. I mean, that sounds, and it is, absolutely ridiculous. Well, it's this kind of ridiculous logic that's being called by some a conversion or a salvation experience. And it's utter nonsense. Nowhere near the scripture. You never see Paul going back to killing anybody. 
period. Let's set the record straight. Salvation produces a transformed life. And if your life has not been transformed by the power of God, you are not a Christian, no matter how religious you may be or may not be, or no matter how much you agree to the same facts. Remember, the demons also believe and tremble. The demons are quite orthodox in their understanding of who Christ is and their relationship to him, what it's going to do to them. So if you have nothing any more or less than demon faith, it doesn't matter. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So these men were in a state of fear. Period. It's a powerful testimony of the power of God. Verse 8, And Saul rose from the earth and went, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was blinded by the glorious light of Christ. Wow. Verse 90, he was uh, three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. I can't prove this, but I believe that Paul was fasting and praying for God's will and direction. I think verse 9 mentions nothing about Paul praying, but verse 11 does. Now, his blindness and this, I would say, fast, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, I'm assuming it was voluntary, lasted three days. Verse 10, and there were or was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, not related to one who was killed, uh, okay, in Acts 5, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. So, notice in the vision, he's having a conversation with the Lord, okay? Notice how these disciples address Jesus. They called him Lord. Notice that the Bible also addresses Jesus as Lord. I like that. A lot of people haven't figured out yet that Lord is not his nickname, but that's one of his divine titles, and you should treat him as such. I mean, you, you, you rarely see anyone called Jesus Jesus. The, the predominant time, they call him Lord in Scripture, in the New Testament. When they're relating to Christ, they call him Lord. That's very important, because it seems like a lot of people keep forgetting who he is. You know, they want to talk about Jesus is the sweetest name, so is Lord, because that's who he is. And people keep forgetting that the predominant usage of people's relationship to Christ directly was he is Lord. Period. Verse 12, excuse me, verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and acquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. What is remarkable to me is how in the world did the news get from Jerusalem to Damascus? That, that is quite a distance. I mean, everybody knows what's going on. News travel very quickly without any kind of electronic devices or anything like that. Now, Ananias, of course, was afraid. But his fears about Paul and about meeting Paul were unwarranted. Because the Lord had everything under complete control. Sometimes we question the plan of God because we don't understand what God is doing. But the issue isn't whether we understand the plan of God has before we obey it. It is that God has told us to do his plan whether we understand it or not. We don't need to, to obey if we get our own approval of the plan of God. Well, God says this, but hmm, let, me, let me contemplate that. I have to give God my approval of his plan. No, you do not. See, the question I've been asking for decades is, who is God in the relationship? Who has the right to, to command who? Who is God in a relationship? Uh, there's only one God in a relationship, and it certainly isn't us. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings 
and the children of Israel. This is incredible. Very much so. The Lord said, get going. <laughs> we use our vernacular, stop questioning me and get going. Stop questioning my will. And go. He belongs to me now. He's my chosen instrument, which will bear testimony to my name. The name he once hated, I will use Paul to witness to everyone, to the entire world. Get going. Verse 16, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Hmm. Mm hmm. That only refers to Paul, not to me. Oh, we want to get very theologically stupid about this when it comes to suffering. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. As he made others to suffer, he himself will suffer much for the name of Christ. This isn't revenge on the part of God. The sufferings of Paul were the very plan of God. God caused Paul to suffer was his doing all of his life. All of his Christian experience he suffered. And yet today, people talk about salvation and the Christian experience was always positive, especially Americans. Utter nonsense. Everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be good. All blessings are good, satisfying to the flesh. We have to have everything the way we like it. We pout and question God. Really? Maybe you'd rather be judged. Pouting and complaining and crying to God about things on this stupid world. This whole world's going to the Zal. What are you crying about? Gee whiz. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, had sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So Paul's first greeting from a believer was from Ananias. And he called him Brother Saul. Wow. He called him a brother. Isn't that something how sometimes we rarely ever use that word, refer to people. Yet that's what was what uh, Ananias called Paul. He called him a brother. And I'd tell you something, simply from my own personal perspective. I mean, here is a man knocked off his beast, believing God, believing Christ, having no knowledge of the Christian faith except from an adversarial point of view. And then the moment he becomes a believer, the first thing that comes out of the mouth of Ananias is he's calling him a brother. I'm sure that had a great impact on his experience, on his life. That here it is, the man who was killing Christians, he meets a believer and Ananias calls him a brother. You're my brother now. Wow. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. What love Ananias had in his heart that he would call this man a brother. A person, no matter what they have done when they are converted, is family and should be treated as such. That's very difficult for people. They're very difficult. They harbor a lot of animosity and things towards other believers. If a person's converted, that old life is done away. And we have to receive them. And call them brother or sister because that's what they are. The relationship is different now. Verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. The Lord removed the scales from his eyes. He received his sight, arose, filled him with the Holy Spirit, and he was baptized. You say, well, it doesn't say he was filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 18. Well, it says it previously because that's exactly what Ananias said in verse 17. So we can clearly assume that's what happened as well. Verse 19, and when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. That That is amazing, too, that he stayed many days undefined in, in terms of time, but he stayed quite a bit with the believers there. And, and that's wonderful. you got to remember again, I mean, here's someone who was killing believers. And I think they saw the man was genuinely converted. And that's why there wasn't this fear anymore, except when you get to 
later in the chapter where they, they didn't know that Paul was converted. But they saw him. I, I've never met a person who was saved that was the same person they were. I just, I just never, I'm not the same person I was. And neither one of you have the blessed experiences of ever seeing me lost. You've never seen me. I, and I'm thankful to God you've never seen the way I was before I got saved. Because I was not the nicest person on the planet. And neither were you, frankly. <laughs> you might think you were, oh, oh, he's terrible. Yeah, so are you. And yet, when Christ saved me, he made me a new creature. A totally different person. I'm not the same person. I was saying at the, at the church last week, I, I can't sin the way I used to sin because that person no longer exists. When I sin as an unbeliever, it involved not just the physical, it involved a mentality, it involved a person, a thought concept, everything. That, that Harley Howard doesn't live anymore. You know, back then, sin was no choice. It was just the option of how much and how long and what. Now, I could say no to all of it. And so can you and I. We can say no to everything. Because we have that power now. That's what a conversion will do. And Paul was in the midst of believers. And obviously his great passion and desire before that was to kill him. So he's right there in the midst of them. And he doesn't have that desire. In fact, he wants to know about Christ. That's a genuine conversion for sure. That the man who wanted to kill you is now like you and wants to learn about your same Christ. I'm, I'm sure these people are very happy about that. Obviously. As we'll see, the, the text will say the church is at rest. Because Paul was a believer now. So the, the, the great instigator and persecutor of the believers is now, is now a Christian. And what's interesting, the church has had rest, which means that Paul was so formidable in carrying out his deeds of persecution that once he was saved, the persecution that was, I guess, in full through Paul's work was now done because I'm not saying persecution stopped. It just the intensity of the persecution stopped to the point where those who persecute the church turned on Paul. They wanted to persecute him. They turned their eyes upon Paul. Could you imagine what went on the minds of the scribes, the Pharisees, and everybody else uh, in the, the the Jewish court when they heard their greatest tool for destroying Christians became one? They had to kill Paul. All their vent towards Christianity directly became now towards Paul. They wanted him dead. Again, I'm not suggesting persecution stopped, but it amped up towards Paul. They knew Paul was very formidable, very knowledgeable in the Jews' religion, and now he's a Christian. They know he's going to be pretty formidable there, so we have to make sure he dies. And you'll notice that the efforts of the Jewish leadership was to kill Paul by, by all means necessary. But he was with the believers now. Wonderful. Verse 20. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. That's another evidence of conversion. <laughs> another evidence of Paul's conversion and another evidence of yours is your relationship to Christ. What you see him to be now. He says, Jesus is the Son of God. The eunuch said, Jesus is the Son of God. Everyone converted acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. It's not about you. It's all about Christ. So he's at Damascus. His intent was to persecute and to jail Christians and to kill Christians. And instead of bringing men and women to prison, because of the name of Christ, he now goes into the synagogues and immediately preaches that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's a, a term of deity, by the way. And the Jews knew it. Wow! You and I may not understand the terminology of the Son of God because we don't really, again, as heathen Gentiles, we had no knowledge of the Jews' religion. 
So this is something we're not familiar with. So the term son of God refers to someone who is deity. We're not talking about adoption here, okay? Paul's saying that Jesus is God the Son. Verse 21, but all that heard him were amazed <laughs> and said, is not this he that destroyed them? Which call, and the destroy, by the way, means to, to kill. Which call on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? I mean, another clear proof of Paul's conversion was that others saw a complete change in him as well. They saw, like, isn't this the same guy that was coming to do X, Y, and Z, and now he's preaching the thing which he once hated? He's with the group of believers that he came here to imprison? They were absolutely astonished. They were amazed at what they were witnessing. How many people are amazed at our alleged conversion? How many people were amazed? How many people even care? I mean, this man was so bent on destruction, and yet the Lord saved him. They knew he came to Damascus with every intent to imprison those who claim Jesus as Lord. They knew that Paul was the one with letters from the chief priest with the authority to do it also. But Saul increased, verse 22, the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. That was the message. The focus was on Christ. Who is he? He is the Son of God. He is Lord. That was the focus. That was the message. Nothing else. And today we hear everything else except who Jesus is. And the implication to us if we recognize who Jesus is. If he's God the Son and he's Lord, obviously that means that our behavior must comply to him and his will. Obviously. Saul continued to become more powerful in his preaching. He just got saved some, a little while ago. And in his persuasiveness about Jesus the Messiah, so much so that Paul put those Jews in Damascus to confusion. They didn't know how to answer. There was nothing to answer. Listen, Paul was talking to a bunch of lost religious people. You have to understand that Jerusalem was inundated. Damascus was inundated with the Jews' religion. And those people needed to be saved. And their Messiah was Christ. Everything these Orthodox Jews did up until this point was a waste of time if they rejected their Messiah. Paul's impact on the pages both before and after conversion is nothing short of remarkable. This former hater of Christianity now becomes one of its greatest preachers. As all Jews look for the Messiah, Paul meeting the Messiah, Jesus on his way to Damascus, now preached that he is indeed the Christ or the Messiah. His life now was fulfilled. He was fulfilled. In verse 20, Paul immediately after his conversion and certain days spent at Damascus preached the gospel of Christ everywhere the Jews congregated in the, in the temple and the synagogues. As we'll see later, Paul's habit was to go into the temple and preach Christ as the Messiah. In verse 22, Paul grew more and more in his knowledge and understanding of the scriptures and was such a powerful preacher that he put the Jews in Damascus to total confusion. So much so that in verse 23, the Jewish leaders plotted to kill him. The man was super powerful. I mean, he had a powerful message and he was a powerful man because he was an empowered man. You want to talk about a conversion. Wow, he was so converted, people wanted him dead. 
Paul was everybody's friend in Jerusalem, among the Sanhedrin, among the, the scribes and the Pharisees and other religions. He was, he was pals with the scribes. But when that man became a believer, his conversion was real, that now his friends became his enemies. That's another indicator of conversion. Your former friends become your enemies now, and they treat you as such. And you see it, and you accept it as such. Verse 23, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and he watched the gates day and night to kill him. Wow. These unbelieving Jews, this religious establishment, knew that Paul was one of their greatest vessels against the church, and his zeal was unmatched, his life was impeccable. I mean, Paul was somebody. He had that something, something about him before he became converted. Now as a believer and worshiper of Jesus, they knew that he would be just as effective in the spread of Christianity. The only way to stop Paul was to kill him. The Jews watched the city gates night and day to arrest and to kill Paul because Christianity was a hated movement. As the gospel grew, so did the persecution against it. Today in this country, unfortunately, this would not be true in most cases. Rather than to suffer because of the preaching of Christ as Savior and the Messiah, many in the church have opted to become social and moral activists. And I got a letter from a dear brother last week. He was, you know, during, during this time where, again, we have uprisings, Negro uprisings, and what have you, because of what I consider to be unjustified shootings of uh, a couple of, of men, black men. And, um, you know, Brother Jesse, he, he was moved. He's, he's, he's white, he's my brother in Christ, and he was moved about, he wished he could get some blacks and brothers out here to teach the people, to teach other people. He said, it just seems like the, the, the blacks are theologically shallow. And I said, that's because they are. And he said, that he wish he can get people, you know, um, get a lot of brothers that, that would more be theologically sound rather than social uh, activists. And I told him, I said, I used myself as an example. I said that they, they hated me without a cause. I mean, I came and taught the Bible and all three pastors, they pretty much hated it. They don't want it. They want it. They would, they would take it. But, you know, if I was a social activist and, you know, said rhymes all the times, mighty fine, like Jesse Jackson, I guess that'd be okay, you know, because they, you know, she's shaking it like, I look, <laughs> that's what they want. Negroes want that kind of stuff. They want, you know, want to bring them food and, and flour every day, every hour. You know, Jesse Jackson, they want to rhyme all the time. That sounds mighty fine. But we don't want, let's talk about black on black crime. You know, we don't want to do these things, but we... We want to blame everybody. We want to be social activists and, and get a big gathering of people and steal their money and act a fool. And I said, brother, Negroes don't want to be theologically sound. We don't. When I became a believer, I could not find a black theologian who knew what they were talking about biblically within the area of where I was born again. And it still doesn't exist. I even found some pastors, this is many years after my conversion, they were, they were going to the seminary, which, which uh, <laughs> is so funny. It's so funny, but it's so tragic. Um, I was in one of the pastor's offices during, uh, I guess, one of their revival kind of things. I noticed he went to the seminary that, I, that I'm a professor of. And there was a bunch of them gathered in the room. And for some reason, they began to talk about, you know, the seminary and who this guy Harley Howard is. And we're blessed. You know, they didn't know I was standing right. They had no idea I was standing there. No, I, I'm standing right there listening. And the book of Acts, this brother's on it and blah, blah, blah. And Hebrews. That was, I said, that's, uh, that's great. I said, thank you. And they looked, what do you mean? I said, that's me. I wish I could have took a photograph of the face of those Negroes in that office. They were absolutely stunned. They, were, they all looked like they were shocked. 
I, I said, you like me to pull out my license, I'll do it, but that's me. And the whole conversation changed. Because they couldn't even accept the fact that one of their own was theologically sound and theologically intellectual. They couldn't accept it. It blew them. They couldn't. The whole conversation changed. It was over. All that praise was over. They were, they were shocked. They could not believe it. And I left there just shaking my head. I said, we don't want no truth. We don't want it at all. I don't even know why they would have all this flowery praise if it was someone they consider white. What, what did it matter? It's not in their nature to accept a black theologian. It's just not there. It's rare. It's just not something that's, that's common. And I said, Brother Jesse, it's just not, not common. They don't want it. And I said, we just have to live the fact they don't want it. And I spent many years of my life, bulk of my Christian life, trying to change it. They don't want it. Oh, well. If we can get the two or the three or the four or five, 15 people who just say, you know what, we don't want the truth regardless of the vessel, then we, we go in places. But, but we don't want the truth. We want activism. You know. In their quest to change society, a lot of these men have met with great persecution, which they say is a result of their faith in Christ, but that's a bold-faced lie. They know it. In Scripture, it is abundantly clear that Christians suffered as a result of the spread of the gospel of Christ, not as a result of attempting to change the morals and the political viewpoints of the society. You know, what I am is a pastor. And as such, I'm obligated to tell the truth, period, regardless whether it's to the church or society, whatever. But I'm not a social activist. Okay, I... That's not my calling. I'm not a, a politician. I think the perfect picture of a social activist should be a politician. That's why they go to the state in Washington and what have you to, to work in behalf of the people, on behalf of the constituents. That's not my responsibility. I'm not elected. I'm, I have no desire for political office, none whatsoever. I just don't care for that. I think I have a greater calling, and that's for the souls of men. If you can change the insides, the outsides won't be an issue. But I don't have any desire to be a, a political mouthpiece and spokesperson, whatever, because people would misunderstand me. Because I have views that are quite different than most 99% of Negroes I know. You know, my views on a lot of things are totally contrary, because, you know, everyone thinks we all think like this, and we don't all think like that, and I never have. I mean, as a pastor and as a believer, you have to look at injustice and justice and determine which is which, according to Scripture, not according to your emotion or according to your feelings or whatever. The bottom line is we have to know what is right and wrong, and, and we have to live life that way. But these activism, you know, you look at Jackson and these other so-called black reverends, I wish they stopped calling them that because they're no reverends, they're not Christians, they're not saved at all. They're just a bunch of hucksters. And many black so-called preachers are hucksters and in the model of Jackson and what have you, and that's just the way things are. You know, look at your library of theological books. How many of them written by men, other than myself, black men? We don't write. We're busy hooping and dancing. We don't leave a legacy of truth, of written materials for people they can read and study. That's just not what we do. You know, a lot of these white seminaries don't, don't want any blacks in there. I'm telling you, they don't want us in there. I'm the first seminary professor in that, in that uh, seminary's history that I'm a part of. The first one. The first black, ex the first expositor and the first black one. When I was on radio, I was the first black person on that station, okay, KLA. To me, I'm tired of that. But if it took that to break through the mold... And to, to be used of God to be to open the door for others prayerfully that have that mentality that we're going to we're going to bring in exposition we're going to bring in sound theology thank God for it you know it's it's sad I look at all that and go, you know it's sad that for many years I've seen 
black men that have wasted their talents. I met some young brothers, they were gifted. Oh, they were gifted. But they just never let go of that tradition. They just wouldn't let it go. And that tradition doesn't help anybody. Doesn't save anybody, doesn't do anybody any good. But we weren't invited to the seminaries. When I attended Liberty, there were no blacks there. Except football players. No black teachers, none on the staff. Not at all. Every church I attended that was that was not all black had no blacks on their staff. None. Zero. We weren't allowed in the in the class. We weren't allowed in the group. It's amazing. It's it's tragic, that's what it is. Verse 25, enough of that. Then the disciples took him by night, him being Paul, led him down by the wall in a basket. These faithful disciples lowered Paul down to the walls of the city through a large basket so that he escaped. Wow. Verse 26, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, <laughs> this always, it's not funny, but it cracks me up. It is funny. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I mean, could you, you're in Jerusalem. You didn't know Paul was saved because Paul was in Damascus for many days. I didn't say how long, but it was quite a bit of time. And then Paul comes back, praise God, everybody. Man, they didn't know he was saved. He went into the place where the Jews congregated and attempted to join himself with them, and then folk were terrified. They had no idea that Paul was saved. I would have paid to see that. That must have been something. Again, notice the wording carefully. He is saved to join himself to the disciples. The Bible clearly talks about joining disciples, joining the church. There's nothing wrong with it. You just have to do it God's way. Only saved people can join the church of saved people. And notice their reaction. They were afraid of him because, believe not, that he was a disciple. Oh, you don't get this. You didn't see it. They would not accept him if he wasn't a disciple because you couldn't join the church unless you were truly born again. Only believers can join the church. We already saw that. I'm just saying the language is consistent throughout the New Testament. He attempted to unite with the believers in Jerusalem. They were in terror of him, and they didn't believe he was a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus, in the name of Jesus. Wow. So here's Barnabas. The name means son of consolation. Or son of comfort. He took Paul. Brought him to the leaders. The apostles. And it is evident that Barnabas spent time with Paul. And questioned him about his conversion. And then reflected all the information to the apostles. Verse 28. And he was with them coming in. Coming in and going out of Jerusalem. He was with them. He was a part of the disciples. He was part of the church. He was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus rather, in dispute against the Grecians, but they went about to kill him. So now you have the Jews want to kill him, and now you have the Grecians that want him dead. My, whatever happened to just a, uh, a nice chat, social chat about different religious views? They want him dead. Let me tell you something. If, if it weren't for the fact that killing believers were illegal in America, we'd all be getting killed. Be ready to meet your Lord. Persecution's rising. It ain't, it's not going anywhere. Oh, we have, we have lived under protection many, many years. Many years. We've been living high in the hall of Christianity. God's been blessing this country. Oh, yes, he has. 
We've been singing songs. You know, God bless, God bless America, land that I love. Ray Charles, he be telling folk, you need to thank Jesus and what have you for the country you in. And we always say, God bless America, like the whole world perish, but God bless America. What have we done with God in America? What has the church done with God in America? We're going to get ours. We've been skating, escaping. Only those who have truly proclaimed the truth. God's got to keep a, a witness around somewhere. Period. These are the same people who Stephen preached to and now Paul is preaching to them and they killed Stephen and they want to kill Paul, these Grecians. Same people. The word boldly is interesting. It means that Paul spoke plainly or like it was. I can't stand a man that can't tell the truth like it is. I cannot. That really bothers me. You profess to have the mantle of God upon you to be his preacher. And you can't tell it like it is? Then give it up. Don't worry about what people are going to do. Should have thought about that before you declared you're going to follow the Lord. The only friends I have are Christians, real ones. Everybody else is a lie. They had nothing to do with me. And that works for me just fine. Paul had no hidden meanings with what he said. He was direct, cheerful, courageous, and fearless. He didn't water down his message because of the possible response of the crowd that didn't affect him in any way whatsoever. Wow. The Grecians went about to slay in verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Wow. Now the apostles and other brethren again helped Paul to escape with his life. Man, his boldness was such that he exposed the absolute uselessness of any other religion apart from faith in Christ, his mastery in the scriptures, and his eyes being spiritually open to see that Jesus is the Messiah proved fatal to his opponents they could not refute what he said they couldn't do it they couldn't stop him they couldn't say anything they couldn't answer him and it made them angry angry enough to want to kill him wow man we've been playing with this message People want you dead. You get in their face, you tell them the truth. They want you dead. Deader than dead. They want you gone. Verse 31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Wow. Wow. It's very probable that the great persecution that began with Paul about three years prior to his conversion slowed when Paul became a believer. The other churches outside of Jerusalem, which came to being because of the persecution which Paul began, now experience a time of unbroken tranquility. His greatest opponent was now one of the family. The church didn't slack off because of its rest. Now, that's an important point, too. We slacked off in America. Well, we're not being persecuted, let's just live it up. No, it, it says they were edifying, walking in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Hmm. The Lord built up the church spiritually, comforted the church by the Spirit, and the church continued to grow. There's no slacking off. God gave a time of great tranquility. Great tranquility. I think I said that before, but I just want to make sure I said it right. I almost said great, tran great tranquility from great persecution, which was led against the church by Paul prior to his conversion to Christianity. Now the narrative switches from Paul to Peter. So now we switch 
narratives from Paul to Peter. And the last time we looked at Peter, we saw saw him and John in Samaria confirming the ministry uh, of Philip. Now that this mission was accomplished, they're going through the cities of Samaria preaching the gospel as they head back to Jerusalem. Verse uh, 32, And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. So Peter stops at Lydda to visit saints, and there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise, and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Sharon, or Saron rather, saw him and turned to the Lord. Again, Aeneas was paralyzed, completely paralyzed. And Peter said, Jesus is now healing you. Get up and make up your bed. Notice again what happened to the people who saw the miracle. They turned to the Lord. I said this many times before, I'll say it again. The purpose of the miraculous healings in the book of Acts was to bring people to a place where they could believe in Christ. You never see a following of Peter. You never see Peter exalting himself at all. You never see Peter creating a ministry where people have to follow him. Never happened. Anyone doing that today is a huckster, a lying false prophet. And they don't have the power. And we're going to see this again from Peter. Again, notice the kind of miracles that were healed. This is a paralyzed man. And the time which the miracle took place, it was immediate. So he was paralyzed and he was healed immediately. No, go and pray, lay your hands on TVs or whatever. No. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Jesus wants you to walk, get up and make your bed. And he did immediately. Verse 36. Now there was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha which by interpretation is called Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. There's no question about her death at all. Nine miles away in Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, or Dorcas, falls sick and dies. And it's interesting in my mind to see that she was a woman who was full of uh, abounding or abounding in good deeds or kindness and acts of love to the poor. So she had a, a genuine heart for poor folk. This is a not an activist. This is someone who just has a love for poor people. You know, I may mention that people confuse social justice with anarchy. It's a bunch of nuns. You're an idiot if you do that. You're a moron. If you think that social justice and anarchy are a, a tool to, to get changed. You're a complete blithering moron. I don't get what I want, so I'm going to burn somebody and shoot somebody. That, that's, that person needs to be locked up, or worse. Anarchy is not an acceptable choice. I mean, here's a woman who just loves the poor. Her name means gazelle. She was graceful to everyone. Verse 38, and for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Why would they do that? <clears throat> Why would they ask Peter to come? I mean, she's already dead. She's gone. But why do you think to ask Peter? They knew that man had gifts of healings. And one of those gifts of healings was the ability to raise the dead. So they sent two men to Joppa. They said, Peter, you got to come. Verse 39. What did Peter do? Got up and went. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. That, that's so beautiful. She cared for the poor. Wonderful woman. So Peter wasted no time. Heard the news of Dorcas. The word arose in this verse means that Peter immediately stopped what he was doing and, and went with these men. Got up and went. And it was clearly evident that 
her service, her ministry, as it were. And I don't mean a ministry in some technical office sense of the word, but her service was greatly needed that she helped many, many widows. The weeping widows were displaying all the clothing that she made for them while she was with them. Man, we need people like her. It seemed like everyone comes to church to be selfish. <laughs> I tell you, the church is long, long, long away to what she used to be. Verse 40, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Straight up, by the way. Verse 41, then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. When he had called the saints and the widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. <laughs> they saw the power of God. There's no question about that. She was deader than dead. And so now that Peter sends everybody out, and she gets raised from the dead, and then he brings her out. Here you go. Oh, yeah. Now they believe. Oh, they believe now. No question. No question. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So again, as in verse 35, those who saw the obvious power of, of the hand of God believed in the Lord. Everything that God did in the book of Acts brought people to the Lord, not to the healer. If there was ever a person who could have had a huge following, it would have been Simon. I mean, he's, he's, you know, being used of God to heal people, give restored limbs, new limbs, mind you, and now raising the dead. Peter has no such desire to have a following at all. That's not, that's not what he's there for. Just a servant. Wow. Amazing. Notice again the type of healing, death. The time of healing took place immediately. It's a great gift. Ever since the beginning of our study in this book, we have seen that evangelism was in the mind and heart of God and the apostles. God used all kinds of supernatural powers, and the Holy Spirit filled disciples to do his bidding to get out the gospel. In chapter 2, for example, we, we saw the wind-like sound, the fire-like tongues of fire, and the various languages were used to bring people to the place where they could hear the gospel and believe God. And God also used the Holy Spirit-filled, love-infested church to proclaim the gospel. Chapter 3, God used Peter and John in the healing of the man at the beautiful gate to bring people together to hear the gospel. Chapter 4, threats did not stop the gospel. Rather, it called for more boldness from God's people to spread it. Chapter 5, the death of Ananias and Sapphira and the healing, the beatings, rather, of Peter and other apostles were used of God to spread the gospel, not stop it. Chapter 6 through 8, God used great persecution in his plan to spread the gospel. Chapter 9, Paul is saved and is used by God to spread the gospel. And now the Lord uses Peter to heal and the gospel is spread. What is the point in closing at this point? What is the point of all of this? And we're done. There was no other priority than the gospel and that no matter what her enemies did, nothing stopped the spread of the gospel. Nothing at all. So what can we learn? What lessons can we glean in closing from this? The priority of God in the use of the supernatural is the spreading of the gospel, not as an end to itself. What else? The priority of God in the movement of the church is the spreading of the gospel. The church exists for this purpose. The church is not an end unto itself. It is not to be inundated with man's failing programs and plans. It is to move in the power of and obedience to the Spirit of God. The church is a family. Its care must reach beyond the walls of the sundry buildings to the hearts of all believers, whether we know them or not. And lastly, we must not allow ourselves to set aside the life-changing message of the gospel and preach that gospel to the world no matter what happens to us. This is what we should be doing. This is what we're commanded to do. And this is the example that we're given in Scripture. Lord, again, thank you for Paul's incredible life and, 
and the, the, the incredible life of the church and the incredible spread of the gospel. And that's what we need to be doing. We are commanded to do it. To proclaim the, the greatest news of all, Lord. And that is about your Son. The salvation which he brings to all who will repent and believe in the name of Christ. And we pray in his name this night. Apologies again for uh, the late service. We had a, about a three-hour blackout here. Well, it wasn't black, but it was power outage. So all the power went poof. And uh, there's nothing you could do. Everything was already set up to record, but uh, nothing was working. And I want to make sure that uh, every, I'm, everything I'm doing here is recorded uh, for posterity's sake and for the spread of the word of God. We we'll make sure everything that we're doing here glorifies the Lord. So this is message yeah, message number forty. For those of you who are taking taking notes, fortieth message in the book of Acts. And uh, rest assured, if I have life, God willing, we shall be here for a very, very long time. So God willing, I will see you here uh, next time. Um, I'll definitely have the message, uh, both audio in a few moments, and the video shortly after that. Uh, so God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. And may God richly bless you and keep you is my prayer.